Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Marcia Garrett. I'm the president of the World Affairs Council of Tacoma, and we're pleased to welcome you to today's program. It's the collaboration between the council and our partners, the Washington State China Relations Fund. For those of you who might be new to the council, we have been active in the South Sound for decades, providing quality programs on topical global issues. We seek to engage the public to better understand the world. You can find out more about us on our website, wactacoma.com. We'd welcome your future involvement in our programs and your support of our work. I'd like to call out one program in particular. Next Thursday, February 3rd, we will be hosting Ambassador Miko Hatala, is Finland's ambassador to the United States. Prior to this, he was posted to as Finland's ambassador to Russia. So it should be quite an interesting conversation. It will be moderated by Port of Tacoma Commissioner Deanna Keller. So to the matter at hand, we're here today for what promises to be a really provocative dialogue. Until the not too distant past, Chinese diplomats were diplomatic, restrained, but they're now seen as quite the opposite, outspoken, combative, and obdurate. Among other important topics related to China's diplomats that Peter Martin, our speaker today, will be touching on is his thoughts on the origins of this contentious diplomatic style and whether he believes it's serving China well. I should add that our program, which was originally scheduled for December, got rescheduled to January because um, Peter is now traveling routinely with Secretary Blinken um, and was with him on an Asia trip in December. So we're so glad that you could rescheduled and we could make this happen. Moderating today's program will be yeah. Nora Koki. Oh, you wanna hit your mute there. For those of you who aren't muted, it would be a good idea if you were. Um, moderating today's program will be Nora Kokiar. He's the executive director of the Washington State China Relations Fund. Nora served as a business executive in Asia, running the operations of Cargill in Japan, Asia, and China from the mid-1980s until 2010. During that time, he held a number of positions in business associations, including serving as chairman of the American Association of Commerce in Shanghai, the American Chamber of Commerce, I'm sorry, in Shanghai for several years. He's on the International Advisory Council to APCO, the global consulting firm, and he's a member of the U.S.-China Relations Council. So with that, Nor, the program is all yours. Okay, thank, thank you, Marcia. Welcome to all our participants, especially those from Tacoma, many of you whom I've not met. Uh, Marcia mentioned Cargill, where I spent most of my career. I hope most of you know that that big grain terminal that sits right downtown uh, Tacoma is basically a Cargill terminal. And in my career, I used to sell shiploads of grain out of that terminal. So that's my background. So before I introduce Peter, let me briefly say a few words about the Washington State China Relations Fund, which is the co-sponsor of today's event. The fund is actually the sister organization of the Washington State China Relations Council. The council was founded in 1979, and it's the oldest state level organization focused on improving bilateral relations. In 2020, noting a change in the community that was interested in China, uh, we developed the fund as a nonprofit entity to develop and promote educational programs like the one we're doing today. Since its founding, the fund has created or co-sponsored over 60 events on all variety of topics related to China, its relationship with the US, and in more particularly, the, its relationship with Washington State. The fund is a nonprofit organization, so it accepts donations from individual donors and issues tax deductible receipts. So today I'm pleased to welcome Peter Martin, who's gonna to talk to us about his new book called China's Civilian Army, The Making of Wolf War Warrior Diplomacy. And Peter, could you hold up the book before we get started? You got one right there? Sure. Okay. I got one here. For, for those of you that haven't seen it, that's, that's what, when you go to Amazon to order it, you know what it looks like now. Okay. Um, Peter is a political reporter for Bloomberg News. As Marsha mentioned, he's traveling extensively now, particularly following Secretary Blinken. He's written extensively in the past on es the escalating tensions in the US-China relationship and has reported from China's border with North Korea and its far Western region of Xinjiang. He previously worked for the consultancy APCO Worldwide in Beijing, New Delhi and, Wa and Washington, where he analyzed politics for multinational companies 
while in Washington, he actually served as the CEO. He's interest, the Guardian, the Jamestown China Brief, the Diplomat, and the Christian Science Monitor. And Peter holds degrees from the University of Oxford, Peking University, and the London School of Economics. And in full transparency, I must say that uh, Peter and I were colleagues in APCO. Uh, for a few years, Peter worked in the APCO Beijing office while I was a part-time consultant in the APCO Shanghai office. And we met on a couple of occasions in the past. So it's nice to reconnect today, Peter. Likewise. So be before we start, let me make a few housekeeping notes. Uh, as we heard a little earlier, uh, we all could, we, if you aren't on mute, we can hear you. So please put yourself on mute. Um, we are going to take Q&A from the audience. We'd like you to put your uh, questions into the chat box. My colleague, Michael Fowler, will be monitoring the chat box and he'll be posing questions uh, to Peter near the end of the session. So Peter, let's get started. Um, I'd like to, to take, ask you to take about 10 minutes to, to make some opening remarks. I could be wrong, but I don't think I've heard of anyone else who's written a book on this subject. So what I'd like you to do is tell us a little bit of what piqued your, piqued your interest in this topic and what inspired you to write this book. Yeah, thanks um, Thanks so much for hosting me. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really great to be here and I'm glad that we've got lots of time for, um, for Q&A. Um, I, you know, I, I guess kind of the starting point for me, um, I mean, there are a couple of places. One, I, I arrived back in, in China in early 2017. I'd been away for a few years, um, living in, in India and then in, in Washington, D.C. And, you know, of course, I was immediately struck by all of the incredible progress that China had made. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the country's economy was beating estimates. President Xi Jinping was rolling out the, the Belt and Road Initiative across the world. Um, you know, China's military was building artificial islands in the, in the South China Sea. Um, and, and perhaps most importantly of all, um, uh, the Trump administration was in office in, in Washington and it was busy picking fights with US allies and, criticizing multilateral organizations. And so there, there was this moment where it appeared that there was just this incredible um, void that China could step into and really take on a more global leadership role. Um, but, you know, as I was, as I was kind of, as I spent longer in Beijing, I, I realized that, that for some reason, China was finding it difficult to kind of step up and play that role. Um, it was doing, really well in terms of you know providing inducements to other countries to to get them to do its bidding or uh you know developing means to threaten other countries but when it came to that core power to just persuade others and win over hearts and mind beijing really seemed to struggle and you know this this struck me as something that was going to be really really important as we move into a world where um you know U.S. predominance slowly wanes and there are multiple competing centers of global power, there's going to be a real premium on um, that ability to persuade. Um, and so uh, the more I kind of looked at that theme, the more I came to see Chinese diplomats as, as kind of a microcosm of, of China's broader struggle to communicate. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny, you can, you can see it almost on a, on a personal level with them um you know when you when you meet them that they can be suave and sophisticated and funny they speak multiple foreign languages they have degrees from fancy foreign universities um but when they get up on the podium in the foreign ministry um or they sit down from you know across the table from their us and other foreign counterparts they become quite rigid quite stilted ideological and, and of course in recent years even increasingly aggressive. And it, it struck me that this was a group of people um, who, who really have to navigate between two very, very different worlds as they go about leading their lives. There's this kind of closed, paranoid, often, you know, the very secretive world of Chinese politics. And then there's this kind of strange, rarefied world of, of international diplomacy. And Chinese diplomats have to be kind of fluent in both. And so for that reason, I, I, I thought of it um, is I thought it would be a really interesting topic. And of course, 
uh, it, it, it's also become an increasingly prominent topic as the world has started to talk about wolf warrior diplomacy and the way that, that, that Chinese diplomats are behaving overseas, you know, storming out of meetings, telling foreign counterparts to shut up, spreading conspiracy theories about the origins of, of COVID-19. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's become something that's really front of mind for a lot of people. Okay, let, let's start with the basics. Where, where did the term wolf warrior come from? Why are they called wolf warriors? Yeah, so it came from this um, 2017 action movie called Wolf Warrior 2, which was about, um, a, you know, a Chinese hero kind of fighting foreign bad guys on the continent of Africa. It's kind of like a Rambo style movie, not really my kind of thing. Um, but it, it was this, this kind of really unexpected box office sensation in China. It, um, it, you know, grossed more money than any other Chinese movie in history. And I, I, I think the reason for that was that it kind of captured something about this new confidence that, that Beijing felt, you know, this, this idea that China no longer needed to be deferential to people in the West or America, and it could kind of stand up for itself and stand up on its own two feet internationally. And so that that kind of spirit, you know, caught on really popularly with the Chinese public. And, and at the same time, Chinese diplomats were also acting in this kind of more abrasive, assertive way. And, and Western media started to label that behavior wolf warrior diplomacy, um, kind of suggesting that their behavior echoed this, the, the nationalistic um, spirit of that movie. So the, the name was actually, you think, applied by the outside, by Westerners, as opposed to it wasn't internally, they didn't adopt it internally. Yeah, the, the first reference I've seen is um, the BBC's Chinese language service um, wrote a piece using the, using the phrase. Um, there may have been an earlier reference, but I, I haven't found one, and it seems to have just caught on from there. And, and do they, are they proud of it? Do the, do the diplomats like it, or what's their reaction? I, mean, I, would, I would say it's kind of mixed. There are a couple of Chinese diplomats who seem to have kind of relished the term and, and, and like it. But on the whole, it's actually really interesting. You know, I think most Chinese diplomats don't like it. Um, they feel like, you know, all, all they're doing is, is standing up for China's interests. And now suddenly the world is calling them names as a result. Um, and it's, it, it, it's quite instructive, actually, I think, because it kind of highlights this disconnect between the way that, that they perceive their actions and the way that the, the outcome I somehow muted there. All right, where did where did where did you um where did you last hear me? Oh, now you're muted. <laughs> All right, I'm just I'm just going to plow on. So, um, I I, I think that the, you know the fact that Chinese diplomats don't like this phrase kind of highlights this this really interesting um, disconnect between the way that they perceive their actions in the way that the world perceives them. So they kind of think of their actions as um, a response to a China which has been ganged up on, is criticized for its, you know, the, 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 um, its leadership's abolition of term limits, its human rights policies, its economic and trade policies, and is really a victim of, of, of Western countries led by the US ganging up on it and they're they're just trying to defend their country and and um and the leaders that they work for and of course the the, the rest of the world kind of sees this rising superpower um which has all of these economic and military means at its disposal um and is you know discontent with the way that things work and is willing to to shout down people who disagree with it but just you know this the, the the very term itself kind of illustrates that i think yeah it's it's <laughs> diplomats what we would say being undiplomatic but we'll move on right uh, right so so actually in your book you tell us that this concept of what is now called wolf warriorism actually probably dates back from the very beginning of when china 
kind of after the PRC was founded and they started sending uh, diplomats overseas. So can you go back and tell us, I think about Joe and Lai and that period? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the really distinctive things about Chinese diplomacy is, is the fact that um, there's been this demand right from the outset that Chinese diplomats be incredibly disciplined and extremely sensitive to the, um, the wishes and, and, and will of, of, of people in Beijing and the, the country's top leaders. And that really stems back to um, you know the nature of the political system and and the situation that the, the Communist Party and you know led by Mao Zedong found itself in, in in 1949 when it took over, basically the country had no diplomats to speak of. It had booted out all of the the nationalist um, diplomats um, who had stayed behind after the communists won the the revolution, and they they faced this kind of paradoxical challenge you know on the one hand um this was a, a a communist party which had spent the last few decades you know based underground being chased around the country leading this kind of revolutionary armed struggle against an incumbent government and was was very aware of any threats to its um to its rule and uh you know and pretty paranoid about the outside world and, and on the other hand, um, you know, the communists needed to establish themselves as the legitimate government of China um, and to win friends and build influence and somehow do that with this group of people in their new foreign ministry who had never conducted diplomacy before, many of whom had never even been outside of the country and some of whom had never even met a, a foreigner before. And so the way that they did that was that China's, the, the you know, communist China's first foreign minister, Zhou Enlai, came up with this approach where he said that the Chinese diplomats should think and act like the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. So they should model their behavior on the Communist Party's military, which had helped propel them to power. And the core feature of, of, of all militaries, but especially the Chinese military, is, is discipline. And in the Chinese case, it's a, it's a matter of discipline to the, and loyalty to the Communist Party. Um, and so that's meant that when China's leaders have stressed um, the need to, to win friends and build influence, Chinese diplomats have been pretty effective at doing that and following those marching orders. But when they focused on ideology, uh, political crackdowns at home, cult of personality of Mao Zedong and now Xi Jinping, uh, Chinese diplomats have also been very responsive to that. And they've responded in ways that we would now think of as wolf warrior diplomacy, partly to protect themselves in those kind of testy times and, and partly because they're ambitious and they hope to get promoted. Yeah, I think in the book, you also mentioned that um, during the Cultural Revolution and other times of purges, et cetera, the diplomats were some of the first ones that were kind of singled out because they had been tainted by dealing with foreigners or something of that nature? You know, this was, this was a, um, a, a communist regime which, which really stressed even more than the Soviet Union, you know, the kind of purity of, of, of simple peasant values and, you know, was, was very, um, you know, dismissive and, and hostile toward any kind of bourgeois behavior. Um, and, you know, diplomats as part of their jobs need to go around the world and attend cocktail parties and wine and dine people, go to receptions, um, you know, listen attentively to, to what others are saying without necessarily immediately getting into arguments with them. And, and so Chinese diplomats did that in the 1950s. And, and by the time the 1960s rolled around, they were being called ideological traitors for but just having done their jobs. And so, um, you know, that, that was a problem then, but there's always been this sense in, inside the Chinese foreign ministry that, you know, I need to be careful how I, how I act now in case the political winds change in Beijing and it lands me in trouble in the future. Um, and, and, and that's led to a certain kind of jumpiness on the part of Chinese diplomats. Yeah, I, 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 I've heard you mention, and of course I've had the experience many times, is. Uh, in most cases, Chinese diplomats are always travel in pairs, kind of, I presume they're looking, they're watching each other, so to speak, to, to make sure to check the ideological purity, but that's a, they're not, as you say, in very rare occasions are they spontaneous. They are sometimes, but not very often. 
Yeah, and you know that that rule actually dates back all the way to to 1949, and China's very first um, diplomats in the in the the Chinese embassy to the to the Soviet Union in Moscow decided that although Moscow and Beijing were very close friends, it would be too kind of politically risky for for them to go out on their own, and so China's first ambassador to the Soviet Union, Wang Jiaxiang said and kind of led by example and said, I'm going to walk around with a buddy who's going to keep tabs on me and I'll keep tabs on him. And, and they've done it ever since. And there have been times, you know, in the nineties and the two thousands, things were a little bit more relaxed in China and, and diplomats would kind of venture out on their own. But, but under Xi Jinping, the current president, um, that, that rule has been, um, you know, kind of implemented with renewed zeal. But what, you know, one of the things that I found really interesting kind of looking into it is when you, you talk to US diplomats about, about that rule, they'll kind of say things like, well, you know, I feel really sorry for them. It must be really embarrassing to be a diplomat and to have to go around in, in a pair like that and, and, and know that you're not trusted by your home government. And, you know, I guess that's kind of my instinct too. Um, but when you talk to Chinese diplomats about it, they'll say, well, you know, I see that, but, uh, but actually it's, it's kind of a protection for me because it means that if anyone ever accuses me of leaking anything, um, mm -hmm. I can say, well, this person was there and they can vouch for me and they, you know, they can say that I was, I was loyal to the system the whole time. And so I think that's a really interesting example of how, um, you know, kind of regular people inside a very different system um, will have their incentives completely turned on their heads um, just by virtue of, um, of having to live and work within that system. Yeah, I guess uh, you travel with Secretary Blinken. Do U.S. diplomats usually travel and pick, you know, stick together or is that uh, yeah, similar they, or not? It's, it's not similar. They, they don't have um, a, a kind of buddy system like that. You know, all... all um, uh, diplomatic services around the world have some kind of regulation of how you deal with um, foreigners. Um, that you know, there has to be because you know they they deal with sensitive information and and um, they face risks of espionage and all, all kinds of things. So there are rules. You know, U.S. diplomats will have to report foreign contact, um, and of course they have to be very careful with classified information. Um, but they, you know, they don't have to walk around in, in pairs or anything like that. And kind of at the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, you know, North Korean diplomats who walk around in pairs and, and, and Chinese diplomats who, who do the same. Um, and really that's a reflection of, of just um, the, the, the different stresses that each political system puts on, on secrecy and the degree to which they're paranoid about, about foreign threats. Yeah, I would just from my career, I, I would briefly throw in, um, I had the opportunity because I was the head of Cargill China a number of times to host the Chinese ambassador to the US. So Yang Jichu, and, uh, the, I forget his successor. And they would, we actually brought them to our head office on, and they would travel by themselves. But any, anybody below the ambassador level, no, it would always be, it would always be in pairs. So let's, let's, uh, let's move just quickly a little closer in time. Um, some people have said that the uh, wolf warriorism is somewhat a response to uh, President Trump and his Twitter storms, the way that he would conduct, uh, conduct diplomacy on, on Twitter. Uh, do, you, do you see that that's got any merit in that, that, this, that argument? I think there's something to it, for sure. Um, I think that um, if you, you know, I, I remember sitting in, in foreign ministry briefing in Beijing when uh, the Trump administration was kind of in, in full swing and Secretary of State, or then, then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was, was saying provocative things about China and, and in some ways going further than, than Trump and others around him would, he would say things like the Communist Party is not the legitimate ruler of China and would really question Communist Party leadership. And, and the foreign ministry just responded in this extraordinary way you know they're they're talking about their direct counterpart in the most powerful country in the world and they would they would hurl back these kind of personal insults of of Pompeo and I think the, the reason that they behaved in that way was they felt like he kind of crossed the reddest of red lines for them he he went after CCP rule and CCP legitimacy and and, and you know in my mind there's there's no question that 
the fact that that they felt that way and the fact that he said those things exacerbated some instances of, of wolf warrior diplomacy. The, the problem with that as a kind of broader explanation is how do you then describe, you know, explain the way that China and Chinese diplomats were acting in Canada and France and Australia, Venezuela, Brazil, you know, the list goes on and on. Yeah. And, and, and the Trump administration was not in power in those places. And, and so I think to understand that, we have to look at some of the, the dynamics going on at home in, in China as a way to um, explain what was happening. But, but there's no question that the Trump administration exacerbated things. And um, so let, let's talk about how effective it's been. I mean, so this is, you know, whenever there's a, you might say an insult or the, whenever there's something that China doesn't like, the wolf warriors, you know, snap into action. Zhao Lijian, the, uh, the foreign ministry spokesman is the most outspoken, but, but you hear it, you know, about Lithuania today. We heard it about Australia earlier. So how, uh, is it winning friends and you know, influencing people, this, this kind of style? Uh, so I, I think on the whole, it's been really, really counterproductive in terms of China's um, image. Um, you know, you'd look at um, Pew polling on China's reputation around the world. There's been this kind of dramatic decline in how, how favorably people people think of, of, of China across countries. And of course, that's been driven by a lot of things. It's been driven by um, China's policies in the South China Sea by its crackdowns in Hong Kong and, and Tibet. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a whole range of things that's contributed to that backlash. But I think that the wolf warriors have, have, have kind of played into that and, 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 and in some ways played a, quite a crucial role because as, as you'll remember, there, there was for a long time this kind of um, disconnect between China's like assertive foreign policies and its quite aggressive actions and regional disputes and those kind of things, but then the relatively soft tone that its diplomats took. And it was quite hard to kind of square those things and, and to reconcile them. But now, of course, there's a, there's a human face to Chinese assertiveness and it's, it's wolf warrior diplomats. And so I think um, the overall, um, you know, it's been pretty counterproductive. I, I, I guess I would caveat that with a couple of things. I think in some places at some times, um, you know, the, the very direct way that Wolf Warrior diplomats go after US leadership has some resonance. I imagine that there are people uh, who are supporters of Vladimir Putin who quite like it. Um, you know, Viktor Orban's Hungary, you know, levels very similar criticisms of the US. And so I think there's space there. I also think that, that there, are, there are contexts where wolf warrior diplomacy is, is kind of eclipsed by the sheer um, effectiveness of, of China's economic diplomacy. You know, the wolf warriors have been relatively quiet in Africa. They haven't, they haven't targeted African leaders in that same way. And China, of course, also is, is leading in terms of infrastructure spending and, and, and has a very positive agenda to sell there. And so, so I, think, I think that the impact has been, has been negative, but it's not equally negative in, in all places. And just finally, from the perspective of Chinese diplomats themselves, I think that a lot of the time, you know, these are smart people who've lived overseas for many decades, are often educated overseas, have a really and have a really good grasp of what's going to land well in a host country and what's not. Um, you know, they're not they're not blind to this, and they are behaving in this way despite the fact that they know it's going to harm China's reputation. And I think the reason that they do that is because they have other motivations, primarily showing that they're loyal to Xi Jinping um, and and wanting to look tough back home when they know that that's what. Chinese citizens and Chinese politicians expect of them. And so even though it's, it's harming China's reputation, it might still be serving their personal interests to behave in that way. So they're put playing to the domestic audience. Right. Basically. Okay, but, but Xi Jinping came out not that long ago and said that the Chinese media, I think, it's a, it should make China more lovable around the world. And maybe what you said uh, makes sense that maybe in Africa and places like that, that's where he wants to be lovable and he doesn't really care about the US, Canada, Australia, et cetera. I don't know, what's your reaction to that? 
So a couple of things. I think um, the, for, for Chinese politicians, including Xi Jinping, there is this view of um, popularity and the, this idea of what it means to be a lovable country, which is very much tied in with a nation's power. You know, I think that they think of Hollywood and blue jeans and the appeal of the popular appeal of the United States is very much tied into the fact that the US is the world's biggest economy and has the most powerful military. And, and many of them feel like eventually as China becomes more powerful and the US is in decline, that they too will command that kind of respect. And then it will just come as part and parcel of them becoming more powerful. Um, so that's kind of one line of thinking. I, I think that the other, um, the other kind of thing to say on that point is, was really, uh, it was there in what Xi Jinping said when he said that China wanted to be more lovable. Um, he, he, he indicated that the rest of the world should like China, but he didn't list any areas where he planned on making policy changes. All of the focus was how do we how do we sell China's message in a better way to the world? But he didn't say we're going to soften our stance in the South China Sea, make nice with our neighbors, stop fighting with India and Canada and France. Uh, he just said you should sell those policies in a better way. And 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 you know maybe maybe in some areas there is way there is a way to just kind of do a better PR job um, with China's policies. But in in other areas, I really don't think there is. How do you, for example? write a press release about China's use of re-education camps in Xinjiang in a way that's going to be, uh, you know, that's going to make sense or be convincing to a US audience or, you know, a member of the House of Representatives. I don't think you can. There is no way to phrase that in a way that's acceptable to a US audience. And, and, and kind of therein lies the limitation of Xi's drive to be lovable. Yeah, and I, and I, and I know you've noted on other talks that she goes to Davos and she goes to the UN General Assembly and he makes very diplomatic speeches about, you know, we're all in this together and win-win, et cetera. Um, but if you read the, what he, his speeches to the domestic audience, uh, they're much more striking. But... Right. There are kind of two Xi Jinpings. There's like, there's the Xi Jinping who speaks at home and is very bombastic and nationalistic. And then there's the, the Davos Xi. Um, but, uh, you know, I think increasingly the world kind of views them as one and, and, and realizes that um, uh, maybe that, that domestic Xi Jinping is, is kind of closer to the truth. The, the real Xi Jinping. Right. 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 <laughs> Got it. So has there, been, uh, has there been any pushback? I mean, so uh, as, as you said, it's not winning friends and uh, influencing people in many parts of the world. So, uh, you know, are there are there people in the diplomatic corps or other parts of the Chinese government that are saying, "Hey, yeah, uh, you know, the, we're this you're pushing the line here." Yeah, you know, I I think that actually inside China's foreign ministry, for what it's worth, there are a lot of people who who don't really like this approach, particularly members of kind of older generations. There was what you know, China's former consul general in San Francisco, a man named Yuan Nansheng actually um, published some remarks where he, he warned of this trend toward extreme nationalism in, in Chinese behavior. Um, and, you know, there are, there are other people who feel like that. The, the problem is that um, they don't feel very empowered to speak out in Xi Jinping's China. As, as far as we can tell, Xi Jinping likes that, the assertive new kind of brash, bold tone. And uh, until he signals otherwise, I think it's gonna continue. And how about um, the man on the street? Do they have, are they, I guess, number one, are they aware of, of what the diplomats are saying? And is there you know, any, any feedback from the, from the guy that works for Alibaba or a, a employee of a foreign company, a Chinese employee of a foreign company in Shanghai or Beijing or something like that? Yeah, so, I mean, you know as well as I do that it's, um, it's, it's kind of notoriously difficult to, to draw those inferences. 1.4 billion people, and then also they don't tend to like expressing their political opinions out loud too much. But, um, you know, I, I think a couple of things. First, Chinese people don't think about foreign affairs. Regular Chinese people don't think about foreign affairs very much, just like regular British people don't spend too much time thinking about what Britain's foreign secretary is doing and, 
And, you know, most Americans don't think that much about Anthony Blinken. But in as, insofar as they do, I think that this approach is broadly popular. I think that there's this, this widespread feeling that China has arrived on the international stage, that um, the country deserves more respect, has been pushed around for too long, and that wolf warrior diplomats are doing a pretty good job of, of standing up for China's interests. There are people who disagree with that. There are people who, who would like to see the country kind of soften its tone and recalibrate a little bit. But as far as I can tell, I think it's pretty popular. Yeah, and, and I would say, um, and I'm sure many of these people on this uh, on today's webinar who have spent time in China know that you know the Chinese kids from a young age are taught about the opium wars and how the country was invaded, and uh, particularly they're taught they're 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 taught about the Japanese and the awful things they did. So um, I, I can see where probably the the man on the street says, "Well, it's only it's only right that we defend our interests." I can see that. Um, any, any chance of it being toned down anytime soon? I mean, uh, is it has it reached its peak or is it going to continue this way? Any thought on that? I, I don't think that the kind of assertiveness is going to be toned down. I think that Xi Jinping likes it. He wants his diplomats to express themselves strongly. Um, but I think what we have seen is a little bit of moderation of the, the tactics. You know, there was this period, the first six months of the pandemic, when um, Chinese diplomats were just picking fights all over the place, especially on Twitter, and, and sometimes seemed to be kind of making up aspects of Chinese foreign policy on the on the spot. You know, you mentioned um, Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijin. At one point, he, he sent a tweet uh, late at night, and as far as I understand, without permission from anyone in the foreign ministry hierarchy, which suggested that the US Army had deliberately started the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's an extraordinarily explosive thing to do. And, um, and frankly, it, it kind of flies in the face of how China's political system works. You know, that the country and the system is all about party unity, and, and under Xi Jinping, it's about party unity under Xi and, you know, all singing from one hymn sheet. There's no space there for kind of mid-ranking officials to freelance policy. And so, so I think that on that kind of tactical level, we've seen a little bit of recalibration and a bit more consistency in the way that, that China expresses itself. And I, I, I expect that to continue, even if the boldness and the assertiveness also continues alongside it. So I, I have a, a, a number, I have a several more questions, but um, questions are coming in the Q&A, and I want to give people a chance to, um, to get their questions asked. So why don't we, right. Michael, why don't we take a couple of the questions from the Q&A box, and if the conversation drags, I can always jump back in with more of my questions. So Michael, do you want to sure. ask them, or do you want me to read it? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. Nora. Okay, please. Um, well, we have the, the first uh, set of questions uh, comes from Ann Tyson, the Christian Science Monitor's China Bureau Chief, and R. Marcia. Uh, these, this, these questions have to do with the Olympics. And paraphrased, uh, what images does China seek to project to the world with the 2022 Olympics compared to the 2008 Olympics? And how has the world's receptiveness to that message shifted? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think I think in terms of in terms of the image that China seeks to project, the 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 the, the, the main priority actually is domestic audience. It's showing people back in China that China is a respected country, which you know uh, is is uh, is seen as a leader in the international system and is a you know is a major sporting power and and, and those kind of things. Um, and, and the, the goals aren't so different to, to back in 2008, but what is really different between 2008 and, 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 and now is the, the, the broader context within China. You know, the, the, the 2008 Olympics took place as part of a really wide ranging campaign to rehabilitate China's image in the aftermath of the Tiananmen massacre. 
Um, so it went alongside a, a diplomatic charm offensive. Um, it went alongside, you know, economic reforms, which were going to open up the country, um, a softening in some cases of, of China's stance on, on territorial disputes and uh, even hopes, perhaps misplaced, um, that, that China was going to liberalize politically. Um, and so in that context, sports diplomacy was kind of part of a bigger package, which made CCP rule more palatable to the outside world um, and improved the country's reputation. And I think what's striking now is that, uh, you know, Chinese leaders want to win respect and improve the country's image in, in much the same way. But, but, but many of the other elements of that package have kind of disappeared over time. Very few people now expect widespread economic liberalization from China's leaders. There's widespread international outcry about human rights crackdowns and, and abuses in, in, in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. There's concern about Xi Jinping becoming a Communist Party leader for life, about China pursuing territorial disputes in the East China Sea, the South China Sea with India, you know, and a, a, a whole range of of nations. And so the ability of the Olympics to kind of improve China's image while all of the rest of the, that kind of broader package is not in place, I think is pretty limited. A, a, a second part of this question is, uh, does, do they care about what the international uh, audience thinks about them? It, it, has that changed over, over time between 2022 and 2008? Um, I think they do care, um, but it it, it kind of links back um, to, to to what I was saying, uh, you know, much earlier on in the conversation about um, this 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 view of 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 how Chinese power connects to the country's image, and I think I think there is this kind of expectation that okay, well, Wolf Warrior diplomacy is um, is, is is causing our reputation some damage. But maybe we can just hold out, and over time, the influence of the U.S. will wane. Um, countries will realize that that China has lots to offer on the economic front, and in terms of positive inducements in its foreign policy, and and you know all of this kind of outcry will will die down. Um, so I think you know they they do care, but they they think they might be able to trump it with other considerations. Uh, and do they care more about the domestic audience than the international audience? Yeah, I mean, I think I think for Chinese diplomats, the domestic audience is kind of priority one through ten. Um, the international audiences kind of come in after that. You know, if you're if you're a Chinese diplomat, you're going to be thinking about, you know, what will Xi Jinping think of this, and what what tone has he set for China's political system? What will what will Chinese political elites think of this? And then also, what will Will Chinese citizens think? And you know, China's not, not a democracy. It doesn't hold elections. Online speech is very censored. But but it is possible to kind of get some sense of at least what a big portion of the population thinks about foreign affairs. And on the whole, people who go online to talk about it are pretty hawkish. And so Chinese diplomats have to contend with all of that um, before they think about what foreign audiences might think. Um, we have a, a question here from Goran. It's a uh, when these, uh, in paraphrasing, when these uh, wolf warriors come out and 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 make these uh, statements, um, do they do it be because it'll increase their social score? Uh, and, and the social score is you know something that the Chinese have recently done. We you know, fixing scores to people uh, on how patriotic they are and the like, as you know. So so for the audience. Yeah, I mean, I so I think, um, you know, that China's social credit system is a whole kind of separate topic, which which might um, drag us off into a slightly different territory. I think I think what they are concerned about, rather than the social credit system, is is more their kind of political credit within the China within you know the the, the Chinese Communist Party system. Uh, how well are they, you know, how loyal are they seen as being to the regime? How well are they seen as serving the interests of, of the foreign ministry and then of, of, of China's leadership? And they're going to be concerned about that. And there's, there's not so much formal scoring that goes with that, but they're certainly thinking about how, how they stack up inside the system. 
with regard to uh, China's foreign influence in Southeast Asia, how do you, uh, how would you um, characterize the, their influence relative to that of the U.S. in Southeast Asia, and, and what, do, what, what would you attribute it to? Uh, would it be economics or would it be diplomacy? Um, I, I would say that on the whole, there is quite widespread concern in Southeast Asia um, at you know, the, the, the kind of strident approach that China has taken toward territorial disputes. So people uh, are concerned about the activities of, of the Chinese military and, and something uh, called the Chinese Maritime Militia, which is this kind of semi-naval state-run fishing fleet that the Chinese government operates. People are concerned about that in Indonesia, in Malaysia, they're very worked up about it in, in Vietnam. Um, and so there is, there is quite widespread concern, but there's also this recognition that, um, well, perhaps on those kind of security questions, they want to pursue closer ties with the US and make sure that, that American naval power has their back. They also need to be very aware of the fact that China is, you know, this huge economic player in the region and their, their future economic growth depends on, on having a good relationship with China. And that's something that's driven home in particular by the fact that, you know, the, the, the US is not pushing any major trade deals in Asia. It doesn't have its own positive economic agenda for the region. And so they kind of have to, whether they like it or not, they have to kind of come up with ways of, of living with, with Beijing. And, you know, responses kind of vary. Cambodia has very much thrown itself into Beijing's camp. Um, you know, in, 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 in the last year or so, the Philippines, after a bit of a wobble, has moved closer to the US camp. Viet Vietnam, bizarrely, for, for people who know the, the history of the US and Vietnam, is actually moving much, much closer to the United States. And then countries like Malaysia and Indonesia are playing this kind of careful uh, uh, sort of tightrope act in the middle. Right. Um... We have a question also from, from Sam Kaplan about how much do the diplomats actually know about the countries where they serve? And uh, also, do they relay what they know back to Beijing or do they uh, tell Beijing what they think Beijing wants to hear? Um, so on the first point of how much do they know, um, you know, for a long time, there was this, this quite difficult learning curve for Chinese diplomats where they didn't have, say, a, a ton of Arabic speakers or, you know, they, lots of languages around the world weren't, weren't um, they, they didn't have a great deal of expertise in those areas. And those, those days are largely gone. I would say on the whole, Chinese diplomats are a pretty impressive group of people when it comes to their knowledge of the countries that they serve in, their language abilities, um, and, you know, increasing grasp of technical areas like climate change or international financial regulation. Um, so they, they, they've made kind of um, pretty impressive um, strides in those areas. And in some ways, the way that the Chinese diplomatic system works gives them an advantage over even U.S. diplomats. So U.S. diplomats will typically be, be encouraged to become generalists. They might return to a country like China a few times in their career, but they'll also uh, cycle in and out through different regions around the world and different countries, whereas many Chinese diplomats will spend their entire career going back and forth between one country and Beijing. So they have really quite impressive institutional knowledge, um, and sometimes in a, in a way that's really confounding to foreign counterparts, you know, Chinese diplomats will say, well, actually in 1972, your premier said this, and it, you know, it's kind of quite a flustering experience for someone who hasn't um, got that kind of institutional knowledge. So they're quite impressive um, when it comes to country understanding. Reporting the truth back to Beijing is, um, is something that's always been difficult for, for Chinese diplomats. It's, in, in fact, it's, you know, relaying bad news is, um, is, 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 a, is a kind of challenge right across the Chinese um, political system. Um, and, and actually for that reason, uh, the Chinese government has set up this system where um, think tanks will also um, send reports to the top leaders in Beijing in case embassies don't, don't report the full truth. Um, 
and and and, and try to skip out on on bad news and even actually Chinese overseas media will uh, will send back cables to Beijing, classified reports to Beijing, which are never publicly published uh, in a way that kind of mirrors the way that an embassy or even an intelligence service would would, would function. And, and part of the reason they do that is because the leadership in, in Beijing is very aware that they have set up a system which dissuades people from telling them the unvarnished truth. Very good. Um, and what, what, here's a question from Hans, a, a general question. What would you advise, how would you advise the US to, to respond to wolf warrior mentality? I think in many ways, the US has kind of made up its mind on how it's gonna respond. Um, th there is this, this kind of like knee jerk tendency to want to respond in kind or, you know, really be, see be seen to be sort of visibly fighting back. And I, I think that over time, um, US officials have kind of come to realize that that actually wolf warrior diplomacy is, is doing China's image um, a lot of damage and that the best response is just to kind of sit back and let it play out. Um, of course, that, that's not always possible if you're about to sit down with the Chinese, you do have to have something of a, of a game plan when it comes to how particular meetings will play out. And in that case, I think what they learned from this this very high profile spat which happened in, in Anchorage in, I think it was March of uh, 2021, uh, when uh, China's top diplomat, Yang Jiechi, launched into this 17 minute diatribe uh, where he dressed down Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Um, the, the, the US side has decided that when they meet with the Chinese, they're not going to provide those kind of opportunities for, for public theatrics or opening remarks. And so on a tactical level, it's a matter of um, keeping the cameras away for as much as possible. Uh, this question, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot with this question. I know you fly, you fly with these folks all over the world uh, in, in, in small, in, in planes. So uh, I'm curious to know, this is with regard to US diplomats uh, in China. Uh, I don't know if you can assess the level of expertise uh, in the current uh, delegations of, of diplomats uh, in China versus in the past. Um, so, I mean, I, I have been out of China for more than 18 months now. So there are lots of people in the embassy in Beijing who I, who I wouldn't know in any case is a, is a absolutely massive embassy and so it's not possible to know everyone i i, I would say on the whole I'm, I'm pretty impressed by the the kind of strength of the the bench that the us has when it comes to um to china there are a lot of there are a lot of people and when it comes to you know trade negotiations when it comes to china's political system who have done many tours in the country and have built up a great deal of of understanding and, and expertise um, and, and, and actually the, the State Department uh, now has a program where China watches are posted uh, all around the world in continents, you know, kind of watching China's external activity and, and seeing what Chinese diplomats and business people are up to on the ground. And so um, that, that kind of ability to track China's movements um, is, is, is evolving all the time. And I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, and here's, here's a question from Myrna, and we're getting close to the end of our, of our time, but uh, Myrna asks, can you comment on China's use of diplomacy and other method, methods to increase its presence uh, in Latin America? Um, yeah, you know, it's not, um, it's not an area where I, I consider myself a great expert, but I guess, you know, it's, it's a region where... Um, which web, which Beijing has put an increasing amount of priority on over the years, where it it kind of started from a relatively weak position from this this knowledge that the U.S. kind of used the region as its backyard, and in the Cold War it, it had to battle really hard for diplomatic recognition and to to win over countries which previously recognized 
the Republic of China on, on Taiwan as the legitimate government. And you know, Beijing has kind of come a long way since then. And, and the, you know, the, the fact that there's so much commodity production in Latin America works very nicely with um, many of the economic priorities that, that Beijing has. And it's sought to kind of tie in Latin America to its, its Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative and, and other methods that it has to, to build out ties around the world. Um, and I think, you know, as, as Beijing's presence becomes more expansive, it's going to increasingly find itself butting up against the US, as I said, in a region where the US is very uh, jealous of its influence, precisely because it's, it's so close to home. Um, so it's very much an area to watch in the future. Very good. Thank you, Peter. And uh, I'd like to give the mic back to Marsha. Oh. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Michael. So and Peter, thank you so much for taking your time today. I know you've been a little jet lagged. You've been a lot of, doing a lot of tooting around. So thank you for making this opportunity available to us. Um, on behalf of the World Affairs Council of Tacoma and the Washington State China Relations Fund, we very much appreciate your participation today and we'll look forward to seeing you at a future program. Thanks thank so much, you. Peter. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Thanks, everyone.